going to be a great morning, a great afternoon of um, Holly presentation by Reed Lindbergh. Before I introduce her, I just want to remind you that next week we have um, our, our local wonderful person, Chris Graff, talking about our current situations and uh, all kinds of things. So please be sure to be here for that. Um, is there anything else that we need to make announcements about? If you have ideas about topics, let us know. Yes, if, if you're, I, I, we are, we would welcome more help with Ali programming and getting, putting this all together. So if you're at all interested in any part of it, from refreshments when we're able to provide refreshments to programming, please let one of us know. And, and over here, just acknowledge we have Bob. Rosenfeld, Jenny Callen, Michelle Champeau, and somewhere in the audience is Priscilla Daggett, who does all our mailings. You're at the front row, right there. Blue, blue uh, sweater. So thank you all. Um, so to, on to today. Our speaker is Reeve Lindbergh. She is a daughter of um, author, authors and aviators, both Charles and Ann Morrow Lindbergh. Uh, she grew up in Connecticut, but moved a long time ago, 1968, to St. Johnsbury, where she lives on an old farm with her husband, Roger Nat Tripp, and an assortment of animals doing what I guess a lot of us do, enjoying visits from children and grandchildren from afar. <laughs> uh, Reeve is the author of more than two dozen books for children and adults, most recently, Two Lives, a collection of essays reflecting upon her own life in Milan and the complex history of her family. <clears throat> the title of today's presentation is Memory and Writing. She'll talk about her own work and that of other writers, including older adults she has taught and helped to self-publish. I give you three. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's so nice to come out for this. This is this is my first program in person for however long it's been, 50 years? <laughs> so, so. Maybe just three. But still, it's 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 odd. But one it's wonderful to be here. And I find even though masks are optional in Vermont, I go around and I walk into a place and I quickly put it on because some people, you know, cannot be without uh, mask people. Getting, You're not getting us? Okay. Should I hold it? Let's see if we can just get it a little closer. A little closer? Yeah. Oh, that's good? Okay. All right. So it's wonderful to be out and about. And um, I talk about memory and writing because that's really all I've done, except for a bunch of children's books, I don't know, two dozen maybe or so, children's books, which I mainly did with Amy Ehrlich, my dear friend and fantastic editor. Um, and they all rhymed because when I was teaching in Reedsboro, Vermont, second grade, many, many, many years ago, more than 50, um, I found that the kids, I saw there were groups of kids who couldn't read at all and, and it was hard even to get started. But if you had a book a, or a poem or something, a picture book that rhymed, it just kind of came in uh, almost instinctively. It was like one of those, you know, those games on the playground with, with marbles or with jump ropes. It was just there. So I love the Dr. Seuss books and the Margaret Wise Brown books. Um, any books that had a cadence and a rhythm for young children were, they just worked. So that's after I stopped teaching and had my own children, I started writing um, I, because of Again, because of Amy, I, 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 was, I wrote ver kind of silly verses that were um, for children or just for fun or for my sister who was also a writer um, and just Ann Lindbergh. Um, uh, and then in my first marriage, we lost a, a child, a little boy at the age of two and very, very hard. And I found myself that first, the first day, I found myself writing a a poem about uh, the, a farm in the dark. It's called The Midnight Farm. And um, I showed it to Amy. Uh, and she said, this is a book. And I said, this is a book? 
and she took it to her editor, who also her her own editor, who also thought it was a book. And here we they paired the book with a, that wonderful illustrator Susan Jeffers. I was very honored to work to have her do that, the illustrations for this book. And then I started. I kept on going. I did the very some silly ones. The day the goose got loose, which is just a kind of wild, you know, rambunctious caper on a farm where the goose gets loose and all the other animals go nuts. And, um, and then some just quiet ones. I did a Johnny Appleseed and uh, oh, some nighttime poems. I did, did some work with uh, that wonderful Canticle of the Sun by St. Francis of Assisi, kind of sort of trying to transpose it for children. Um, just whatever came to mind that rhymed. I worked with, with them that way, and I did a, the last, most recent one was not so long, it was well, 2012, a while ago, was called Homer the Library Cat, in honor of basically the librarians I have known and loved, many, many, and um, one particular cat belonging to one St. Johnsbury Athenaeum librarian who ran away and came back, and it was, it was an exciting time for all the children in town. So that was a bunch of books, um, probably more of those, I've written more of those than of, of, of these, the nonfiction books for adults. I did a couple of novels, thinly disguised autobiographical novels when I first wrote for, for adults. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll try a memoir. I'll try something about growing up with my parents because it was something, it was hard to figure out. I'm not sure I still have figured it out. But um, I grew up in a family where both parents were very famous, but they did not want to be famous in the family. And so you had, we had a fairly, uh, not, not too different, some different, um, life with my three brothers and my sister and I uh, in Connecticut on, the, on, near, on Long Island Sound. And, uh, and my father who came and went all over the world, and my mother who was mostly there, very quiet, always writing and gardening and being very connected to her children in a wonderful way. And I kind of still hear her voice um, when I have, when I have difficulty figuring something out, I can often hear her voice and that's a, it's a lovely thing to bring along, along through my life. Um, I thought, I w the first book I wrote about the family is called Under a Wing. And it, I thought I would read a few, just read a little bit, little bits and pieces from that to give you a sense of what I was, what I was working with. And I start with um, my father's time, uh, my father's kind of impression in our lives. It was, uh, he was very, um, very forceful and sure, sure of his, himself and his ideas and also really, a great deal of fun. He was very active. He would take us. He taught me to swim by putting, having me hold on around his neck and swimming out into the into the low tide at Long Island Sound. And, and I was never afraid. I, I was sure he he would make sure I was safe. But he kind of immersed us in many things, and uh, and he we were treated to his lectures. He had many lectures. The uh, what I remember was uh, there was one on freedom and responsibility. There was one on, let's see, uh, it was financial, which was he wanted us to make sure that ev anything that was bought for us, purchased for us, like roller skates or, or actually I think it was, it was regular winter skates, that he, you would write down. You, had to, you didn't, have to, didn't have to earn the money necessarily at that time, but you had to know the cost of everything that was purchased for us that wasn't absolutely necessary. Um, I'm going to see if I can find that. I, we, he used to have us come in to his office at the, at the old house in Darien, and he would, have, he would have these lists, and I could read them upside down because he had, he had on, a, on his desk, he had a list with each child's name, and then you, know, you would look I, to see whether you had a long list <laughs> or a short list. You know, if you had roller, you had skate price, I thought, that's okay, that won't take long. But if you had freedom and responsibility, 
or, or even worse, downfall of civilization. That was a big one. Um, and uh, for many reasons for downfall of civilization, sometimes it was our attitude that would lead to the downfall of civilization. But uh, so what did, I'm just trying, let's see, yeah. Most of the time when he was home, my father's office contained him comfortably and predictably like a hermit's cabin deep in the woods or like the well-designed cockpit of a small airplane. His office was a small square space on one side of the family porch on the first floor. It had been built as a twin to my mother's moonflower porch. She had a moonflower which she, would, she kept on, on a porch and, and she would call us all to, to see it when it bloomed, which was, I don't know, once a year or something like that. Um, but his was much more self-defended with thick arched windows in the places where the moonflower porch had screens and less easy access to the outdoors. The room had a single bed under the window with a Hudson Bay blanket spread out upon it and there were usually manila envelopes and boxes of onion skin typing paper arranged in piles too. His desk and chair were in a corner both smaller than might have been expected for a man his size. Though this was typical of my father, he required a certain amount of room for himself and no more. And he didn't like to waste things, toothpaste or toilet paper, money or detergent, time or space. So, all right. He didn't like television. I disagreed with him about television, which to him was one of the downfall of civilization <laughs> aspects. It held no terrors for me. All I ever watched was Howdy Doody anyway, and who could be afraid of Buffalo Bob? <laughs> I knew my own family would never have TV, and I understood from my father's lectures that it was a bad influence upon young minds and it would be better for us all to be reading books. I read plenty of books, but I sneaked over to the neighbor's house as often I, as I could to watch the Howdy Doody show. I could see it was useful to be able to fly an airplane, or change a tire, or shoot a gun. I did not understand why it was so terrible to eat candy or unenriched white bread, read Dick Tracy comics, or watch television. I thought my father was too often both unfair and absurd. But I stood at the front door of our house with my sister once, confronting a man who had arrived and knocked while the family was having lunch. I didn't hear what the visitor wanted, a thin young man I didn't recognize, and he said to Anne, I don't know what he said to Anne, but I heard her cry out and step back into the doorway, and I saw her shut the door hard and fast, heavy as it was, in the stranger's face. Then immediately I heard my father running foot, father's running footsteps behind us. He opened the door again and step, stepped outside with the stranger, putting his hands on Anne's shoulder and on mine as he passed us, urging us back into the house. But before we swung the door shut again, I saw that he was walking down the paths beside the young man and that he put a hand on the stranger's shoulder too and was talking to him gently and at length. On this occasion, his face didn't have the grim, closed down look on it, the look faithful to duck hunters. He, he was very angry with the duck hunters in our cove. Instead, I saw kindness on it, on it and was confused to see that expression at that time. Kindness and the open, loose-featured loose patience with which he approached nervous dogs or very small children. He didn't have the cold eyes and stern expression of the family disciplinarian on his face or the grim, besieged look of the defender of our property. Instead, I saw he had the look that I saw him. I, he had, I saw him with that look again once years later in another house, gazing quietly down upon a stray bird that had just flown at full speed into our kitchen window pane and lay stunned and twitching in my father's hand. It turned out that the stranger was one of the pretenders, as Anne used to call them, a reference to Charles Stewart, the Bonnie's Prince Charlie, who tried, tried and failed to become king of England. King of England. This man was one of the dozen or more confused, sad individuals who have touched our lives now and then over the years. Each one tells a different story. Each repudiates the stories of all the others. All share the same obsession. Every one of them is convinced that he and nobody else is the Lindbergh baby who died, our own lost brother, Charles. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard from any of them recently, and I think they may be gone. 
Uh, my, my late brother John, who would have turned nine, uh, 89 this summer, he had a renal cancer and died very suddenly. Um, he was a couple of years younger than this, the first baby, whom none of us met. John was born after, after he died. And um, there, all those men were all, all about that, that age, and they, were, they all were convinced and would send letters. And, uh, whew, and it was hard. I met one once, when I, got, uh, I think at the Air and Space Museum. He just came up, and he, he couldn't even talk. He looked so sad. I was pretty sure who he was. And he looked at me, and I, I just gave him a hug. <laughs> I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't think what else to do. And he, you know, he went off. He went, but, but it was very hard, hard to see that, that what, what's, I think it's called delusions of reference. There's something where people um, almost project upon um, somebody else's story their own. And, and I think it's, it, it's, it was unnerving for us, but much, much harder for them. And the story of the lost baby, of course, is the, um, 19, the kidnapping in 1932. I, well, he died in 32, yeah. In the early 1930s of my first brother, Charles, who was taken in, I believe, um, early in the year and um, was found dead in, um, in April. And then we, the rest of us came, and I really didn't hear much about Charles. Um, during my childhood, I, I did, I did hear. I learned about him when my own little boy died. Um, my mother was wonderful. She said, and she said, "Well, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to die a little bit with it, with him, and then you're reborn in other, in other, in your, with, in your other children." And that was really true. But she was completely open at that time. But they didn't talk about it. Um, they didn't talk about it while we were growing up. Oh my. And my father took us flying sometimes. I write about um, his taking me out flying from the, an airport in um, Danbury, Connecticut. They rented a, he rented a little, little Aranka. Um, and he would, it was a two-seater, and he would be flying the plane and you'd be behind him and then he would have, have me uh, you know, use the rudder to lean the plane this way and that, or nose down or nose up. And um, we always snuck cotton into our ears, which he didn't approve of, but it was really, really loud. And I've, and I've actually, I've, fl I've been in one of those, a couple actually, of those um, replicas of the spirit of St. Louis, and it's deadening, it's so loud. Those air early aircraft, unbelievable. And I think many, many pilots of the day were rendered a little deaf long before they would have otherwise. And my father was no exception. But, but the, so we all, we all did that. We all were taken up and flown around. And, and my, a couple of my brothers learned to actually fly the plane. I couldn't even reach the, the rudders. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't, but I could go back and forward and up and down and all that. And, um, and then he, he, had, uh, he had us experience weightlessness. And I think he went up and then down fast, something like that. And his glove would go up in the air. And he'd say, see it? See the glove? That's weightlessness. And he'd say, oh, thank you. But <laughs> so um, my brother John um, did, uh, he did some parachuting. He did quite a, quite a bit of uh, jump right out of the airplane altogether. And I was, I was thrilled that he could do that. He would just jump out of the, my father was not impressed. He said, he said, as many of them do, he said, you never jump out of a perfectly good airplane. So, so not interested in skydiving. He didn't think that was, well, he had to, when he had to jump out of an airplane, it was usually, it, it was going down. He, that, and he had done it. He was a male pilot early in the day. And he would fly from St. Louis to Chicago. And if the weather was really bad and something had, there was something that was, you know, was not going to work out with the airplane or it was stalled or he, he could not land it anywhere, and he would, he would jump with the parachute. And once the plane came around, <laughs> he thought it was going to cut off the, the parachute straps. But he, he made it. But those guys, they didn't, they didn't think it was play. They did not want to go skydiving. Oh my, so that was a, that was an exciting time. And uh, one, once I was the only one of his children who um, was in an airplane with him when, um, when he had to f 
he had to not crash land. We had a forced landing because the, it was an automatic choke. And that was very new to him. He had always done everything by hand. And in this aircraft, that, it got stuck. The mechanism was stuck. He could not, and, it, and the, the engine stalled. And he said, well, put your head down between your, between your knees and hold, hold your head. And he said, we're going to have to land because we can't get back to the airport in time. And I thought, in time for what? But <laughs> so I had no clue. But we went down. We bumped into this cow, cow field, uh, cow pasture at the time in Connecticut. And, um, he, it was nothing bad happened. I mean, he, he didn't didn't wreck the plane. It maybe bumped a little on the rocks. There were rocks. The cows didn't seem to be too upset, and so, but they had to take the plane apart to get it out. And uh, and but I watched him when he was coming down through the air and kind of back and forth and and uh, and and I you could feel it. And I've heard I've heard this from pilots that you're. At, at a certain point, you're not flying the airplane, you're being the airplane. I mean, you just sort of like you put it on. And I've heard that from very modern day pilots in, in you know, really high quality jets of, and, and of course warplanes of various, of various types. And they say, you just have to put it on, you have to wear it. And then, it be, then you become part of it, and that's how you do it. Um, which I hadn't thought of until I saw my father landing that plane. Oh my goodness, all right, where else? Well, my mother was mainly with us. Uh, when he traveled, she was with us, and it was, a, uh, oh, it was such a relief. <laughs> right, so she, and he would leave for a while, and you think, ooh. And, but she was, pretty, she was pretty good at running that household, even without him coming and going, and you know, having all his lists and so on. And, and, and we had a sense of her well, her extraordinary connection with all of us. Um, and I, I was just talking to my brother, my now 84-year-old brother, uh, two days ago. And we were talking about growing up with them. And he said, I don't know how she put up with it. <laughs> and, so, and yet, she, they were wonderful partners. They were very much connected for all the flying years. They flew together to establish the early air routes for aviation. And they, um, and they were partners in writing as well. They would sit together um, with a manuscript set out between them and just go over it, whether it was her book or his book. And uh, if it were his book, she'd say, well, Charles, I don't think that, that word is used this way. I think and she was the English major and the Smith graduate. And she, um, she knew. And he would change it. And then when he was working with her books, he would say, well, um, in this part about the clouds, he'd say, you know, actually a cloud pattern, the cloud bank would not be would not be that way. I don't think you've got the cloud you want. He said, you know, you got your cirrus, you got your cumulonimbus, you got your just, <laughs> and and then he would correct it. All the things that he knew from his uh, his early aviation experiences. My mother was very um, very connected to whatever it was we needed to do. And she always told my sister and me that she thought we should write. Write it down, our mother had told us. Whenever we said something that particularly interested or touched her, write down that sharp insight, that funny story, that especially appealing turn of phrase. She taught us that any experience worth living through was worth writing down. But beyond this, she made us feel that the act of writing about it significantly affected the experience. I did not know whether writing enhanced an event, transforming it into something more important than it would have been had it gone unrecorded, or whether writing just made it more real. Like the testimony of an observant bystander who can confirm that yes, something has indeed happened here. I am a witness and this is what I saw. For my mother, the relationship of writing and living was like the philosophical conundrum about the tree in the forest. If it falls to the ground, but nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? And my mother's philosophy, the question would have been, does the unwritten experience truly exist at all? Does it even matter? My mother was as wedded to our, her identity as a writer as she was wedded to our father. And for that reason, perhaps, she gave herself little credit for being his co-pilot, navigator, and radio operator during the early flights around the world, or for being the first woman in America to earn a glider pilot's license. 
Those were aspects of her life that had to do with her husband's career, not hers. She was a writer first and foremost. We children accepted the success of her 1955 book, Gift from the Sea, as a natural thing and no more than her due. We began by being blasé about it, but soon became fiercely partisan. I remember how vicious my feelings were in sixth grade when Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking edged ahead of my mother's on the New York Times <laughs> bestseller list. Well, this is, I, I just go on and on about all of that and the, uh, what it was to be with them. Um, and the last part of, of this book, I say, in some ways my parents were very different, but I have always believed it was their similarities rather than their differences that brought them together and kept them together for so many years, certain shared independencies of character and spirit that each knew in himself or herself from earliest childhood and recognized instinctively in the other qualities of solitude and stamina, reflection and determination. Their mutual recognition must have been profound, and this, I think, was the foundation of the world they were able to build together for their children within that unlikely marriage over the difficult years, in spite of the tragedies in the newspapers, out of the public eye and against all odds, my parents built from their similar characters and shared spirit a family structure that became the strongest elements in their lives. It remains, I'm very sure, the strongest element in mine. So that was the first one, the first, <laughs> the first memoir. And I did, I did, I did one about my, my mother when she, when she lost, lost words. It was at the very end of her life, and she was living with us in Vermont long after my, my father's death. And she, um, she didn't speak. So you never, she, she was very, very quiet. She was sometimes seemed to be agitated or upset as happens with people who have, will have, she didn't have Alzheimer's, she had those little strokes, mm -hmm. TIA, frontal strokes. And um, sometimes she would, she would sit quietly and talk to you and then she would say, after a while, she'd say, are you my sister? <laughs> and at first I'd say, no, no, I'm your daughter, I'm Reeve, remember? And then after a while I said, I'd say, oh, sometimes, yeah, because <laughs> that's what it was. You know, I was, I was different people in her life, and uh, things would happen. I, she had, I had baby chicks. I thought she would love those. I brought them up to her, and, um, and, sh and I had a little box on the floor, and she'd put them away. She didn't, she didn't want the baby chicks. That wasn't what she wanted. Once we, t we went driving over, a, over the road from St. Johnsbury to Littleton, New Hampshire, which is beautiful, high, kind of a high and... Um, beautiful landscape all around it, and uh, and we were very quiet because she didn't talk, and I wasn't talking. I was driving, and she said, "I'm afraid." And I said, um, "Oh, what is it? Is it is it getting older, or losing friends, or um, life seeming different?" And she looked at me and she said, "It's your driving." <laughs> so, 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 so she she was both there and not there, and. Uh, Oh, and she was with us till, till the end. She died in the house, and we, the family came and had been coming for the couple of years that she was there. And it was, it was, a, it was not always easy, but it was indeed a privilege all the same. We did, I did a little, oops, a little book called Forward From Here, and that was about turning 60. And, um, oh, I don't know. I, I had various things happen, and, but I think... I'm thinking I wasn't, wasn't going to read. Oh, I read, read, I read a book about turtles because I, I found I mean, a chapter about turtles because I, I had um, an experience of, on my husband's birthday. I saw wild geese flying overhead morning and evening and a turtle plodding manfully or womanfully. It's hard to tell with turtles. Along our lane as I turned off the main road from town, I was delighted. I stopped the car. A birthday turtle for my husband, Nat. He loves turtles, and so do I. We've always hoped to have a lot of them in our new pond, uh, which is out behind the house, and it was dug for an, by an excavator. And he says it's not really a new pond because a previous pond had existed in that same spot in earlier times. What earlier times, I asked, thinking of pioneer days, oxen standing knee-deep in the shallows, women in sunbonnets carrying water in wooden buckets. I was way, way off. 
In terms of anthropology, it would be Neolithic. In terms of geology, it would be the Holocene, about 10,000 years ago. Mm. Mm. So another day, I saw what looked like an especially pre pretty painted turtle. So I got out of the car and walked over to it, picked it up. And the turtle didn't like this much, but it drew in its head and waved its little feet. And I, when I set it down in the seat next to me, the feet disappeared. And uh, I brought it home, and my husband was so pleased. What a beauty, he said. And we took it to the pond. And the, um, the new turtle, this new turtle that I got on his birthday, it was just kind of slowly walking along what's known the, as the river road, um, the Passamsic River on the way to St. Johnsbury. And um, it was like a big rock. Um, and I, when I walked back close to it, I got out of the car, I could see it was a snapping turtle. Even though I hadn't seen one before, they're unmistakable. This animal was probably 10 times the size of my husband's birthday turtle and a bigger, big, as big around as a platter for a good-sized Thanksgiving turkey. It was not one bit pretty, maybe, except maybe to another turtle. It had a thick, ridged tail that reminded me of a Florida crocodile and a scary-looking, almost prehistoric head with the mouth like the beak of a very big, very bad bird. But I wasn't doing very much. It was very peaceful. And I knew how happy the birthday turtle had made my husband. And I vaguely remembered something he had once told me that some Native American fishermen on the Hudson had told him many years ago about snapping turtles not biting if they were out of water or something like that. Anyway, I noticed this turtle, as I studied its progress, seemed slow and sleepy. So I picked it up, one hand on the other, each side of its shell. The turtle turned its head backward with a half-hearted logy hiss and a snap, but that didn't daunt me. I put it in the back of my car. I drove it to the home of Ralph and Sue Bullitt, our neighbors, and I, she had asked me to pick up some milk, and I gave her the milk, and then I opened the back of my vehicle to show her the turtle. It seemed a bit more animated with a quicker head movement and a louder hiss. Oh, my, said Sue, sounding just like my mother, what my mother would have said under the same circumstances. By the time I arrived at my own house, I decided it made sense to get a pair of gardening gloves, which I did, and um, picked up the turtle, put it in the bathtub, left a note for Nat and my son Ben. I knew they'd get home before I did. I was going to a program like this in White River Junction. Um, so I called my husband from White River just as he came into the house, and with a telephone in hand, he walked into the bathroom. Oh, my God, he said. I was very pleased. Reeve, you've outdone yourself was so happy. He said, how did you pick him up? I told him modestly, and his voice changed. Reeve, they can lunge the full length of their bodies. Their necks are as long as their shells. They've been known to break broomsticks. He told me the Native American fishermen had said snapping turtles don't bite underwater, not out of water. <laughs> and besides, he thought they were just kind of baiting him, you know. But anyway, he was awed at what I'd done. I was, I was magic. I thought I had turtle magic and was a turtle whisperer. And we, 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 did, we took a big canning kettle, and we kind of got the turtle into the kettle and took it out into the pond. And actually, it disappeared. We I haven't seen him again. But um, that same evening, I heard my husband describing this to a friend over the telephone. And I heard him say, Marilyn Mer Monroe meets Godzilla. He, he still sounded awed and a little frightened, and I hoped I was Marilyn. So, 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 so that was a that was a fun one. I had a good time with that. I had a I had a uh, had a, a div completely unexpected non-malignant brain tumor, and I wrote a little bit about that. Um, it it never hurt at all, and they took it out, and it was. It was okay. It was, not, as I said, non-malignant, and um, I wrote a chapter about it, and I wrote a little, a little poem, um, and it says, my little brain tumor lives in my head. They say it's not nasty or else I'd be dead. <laughs> it's in my meninges. It looks like a dot or a snail with a tail or a small, small Rorschach blot. My little brain tumor showed on a scan. I was asked, can you see this? I said, yes, I can. I can see, I can speak, can count backwards from 10. I can walk a straight line and then walk, walk back again. I can name 15 animals all in a row, subtract from 100 by sevens. That's slow. 
I can write, I can work, I can wander about, I can drive, but I don't, just in case I pass out. If you've had a seizure, which I did, that you're, you're, you don't drive for a year, usually, until they have it controlled with medic medication and so forth. So I would get rides with Fred's, but, um, and that was a small price. I didn't, I didn't want to run into somebody. I can, let's see, I can name 15 animals all in a row, subtract from 100 by sevens, that's slow. Right, I can work, I can wander about, I can drive, but I don't, just in case I pass out. My little brown brain tumor doesn't look scary. It's smallish and roundish, the size of a cherry. It may have to go, though it's shown little malice, but if I can keep it, I'm calling it Alice. <laughs> and I did that until we, until we took it out. So that was that was weird and, and difficult, but but it turned out okay. And um, I just kind of blabbled on with all the different all the different things that I had to say about living here and um, and my uh, family history, a bit of that. Uh, and I had also. A re more recent book from 2018, which again had to do with, with uh, family, but it was called Two Lives. And uh, it really was about having, having my life at the end of the dirt road in Vermont, which was very muddy last week. Um, and I say, I think, I often think I have two lives, one in the foreground, the other in the background, each life taking its turn. I have a real or normal life in the country where my husband and I live on an old farm at the end of a dirt road. We wear comfortable clothes, write books, raise sheep and chickens, are active in community life, and welcome our children and grandchildren whenever they come to visit. There's also an entirely different Lindbergh life, which requires putting on somewhat less comfortable clothes and traveling to places away from the farm where I, where I attend meeting and meetings and give talks and where there are no chickens except for the kind on the menu followed by words like cordon bleu or a la king and kiev, kiev, chicken kiev, I'm thinking. Um, in the second life, I stand up in front of people and talk a little about the books I've written for children and adults and a lot about the lives of my late parents, Charles and Anne Laura Lindbergh. I've spoken about my parents on college campuses and Air Force bases and museums and libraries and schools to children and adults around the country for several decades. When I finish, I come home to Vermont, change clothes, and emerge from the limbo of travel and from my Lindbergh life, settle down with my husband, the dogs, the sheep, and the chickens, immersing myself in farm and community until the next time when I put on my other wardrobe again, and out I go. It may be a strange way to live, coming and going and switching focus between one life and the other, but I've done this for so long it feels like just another part of my routine, like going to the farmer's market or taking care of one of the dogs to the vet. One of the chief differences is that in my Lindbergh life there are different questions to answer. Instead of, how long has she been limping? Or, do you want a bag for that? It's, what's your favorite memory of your father? Or, did your mother teach you to write? Or, what can you tell us about the kidnapping? Or, did your father really have other families? Yes, he did. So those questions are now so familiar, they don't trouble me much. So I can remember when some of them did. Um, before my father's death and my mother's, they spoke for themselves if they chose to speak at all. Speak at all. Most of the, their communication with the world was done in writing. Between the two of them, they published more than 20 books about their lives and reflections over the years. He, they, he did some speaking here and there, and there, there was rarely a question period afterwards. My father disliked being questioned to begin with, and he had been uncomfortable with the, what he called the press ever since his flight to Paris in 1927. My mother said that once when they were about to embark on one of their early survey flights <coughs> together, a reporter begged her husband to reveal at last, at least, excuse me, to reveal at least which direction they were planning to take on their journey. And my father responded solemnly, up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in living two lives. I think most people do this to some degree. When a person gets up in the morning, goes to school or to work, he or she leaves an at-home self behind. Salespeople have sales lives. Office workers have at-the-office selves. Any teacher has developed a teaching self. A teacher needs to be on. 
in a certain way, just as an actor is on for the theater, film, television. When the school day is over or the cameras have stopped rolling or the stage lights have dimmed, then you can be off, just yourself. I'm not really ever off, even when I think I'm completely free of it. Lindbergh life seeps into my everyday existence at most unexpected moments. Then I find I have to move from a kind of low-key daily consciousness concerned with things like laundry shopping, working in my garden, asking people to bake pies for the bake sale for the library, to another way of thinking entirely, a state of mind blended from instinct, training, and long experience. And that's how I confront my family past. I used to pester A. Scott Bird with questions when he was writing Lindbergh, his Pulitzer Prize winning biography of my father. I was writing my first memoir, Under a Ring, which, Under a Wing, which I just read to you a bit. And, um, and he, he asked me questions very discreetly and politely. Once, probably because I had expressed astonishment at hearing how many boxes of material he proposed to go through the Lindbergh collection at the Sterling Library at Yale. 700, he said. He almost complained to me about the material he discovered, items that had been saved by my parents and sent to the university to be stored there in perpetuity. Was it really necessary, he wondered, to save carbon copies of the handwritten notes to our teachers excusing us from school for dental appointments? <laughs> Small squares of blotting paper, probably made by cutting one of my mother's large desk blotters into smaller pieces. Each square covered with the indecipherable reverse blottings of words from kitten, uh, letters or diaries or grocery lists. Did I know anything about this? And I told him, because I couldn't resist, that at our house during my high school years, there were always two cardboard boxes sitting at the top of the stairs to the basement. Next to the basement was the attached garage where my father kept the station wagon. He also drove this car to New Haven when he carried documents to the Yale archives. One box at the top of the basement stairs was labeled Yale for the station wagon. The other was labeled Dump. Do you think the labels could have been? <laughs> <laughs> but there was a great deal of saving and a, and a great deal of uh, very, very careful, meticulous documenting of everything that, that he did and really everything that he thought and uh, it was, you know, I didn't realize. I didn't realize that, that other people didn't live this way. And as I got older, I thought, boy, this is really interesting and very strange. And, I, I, and so I, I went through, I spent some time in those archives when we put together a, a, a memoir. My mother published five, I think, books um, of her diaries and letters from the time she was about 14 at Miss Chapin's school until um, just after the Second World War. So that from 1945, when I was born, to the time she died in um, 2001, just before, it was February before 9-11, um, there was nothing, nothing out in public. So we, we worked on, the family and a good friend worked to, to gather that material that, from the times that, that we were living in. And, and, uh, and there was an enormous amount of material. And it was all very interesting, and we published it with a, with her publisher. They were interested, and it was it was really fun. It was uh, we would go through this stuff, and you'd find something. My brother found his, his kindergarten paintings, and he said, "Now these are important. They should be carefully saved." <laughs> but you'd find little funny little things, little little uh, tickets from from luggage in 1952 that that just. Uh, it, I mean, we sort of going, at, looking at ar at artifacts that weren't. I mean, they were just, it was just a ticket. It's, it's, uh, so I, I didn't have the, I, I knew I didn't have the proper reverence for all this material, but I loved reading things that she had written at length and really never showed anybody. We were able to, we were able to put together and offer the world um, that, that, I guess that was in about 19, uh, 2012 as well. So that was so that was a real history, a, ha a family habit of these memoir-like writings, and I found that that uh, it helped me a lot to be able to put them down in writing. And I was at the same time working with a group of people in St. Johnsbury, 
who, locally who, who wanted to write about their own lives. And we did a, been doing a memoir class in one place or another, once at the um, senior center, and then when the pandemic came, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't go in there. It was, it was too scary for people. So we went to the upstairs of the library and social distance, and people would read their, read their um, well, their stories, they're really, in, all, in every case, it's personal stories that are set down and, and just so interesting to me. There's a man who grew up in Barrie um, on, let's see, Millstone Hill, I think it's called, mm -hmm. and he wrote about, he, he's slowly writing his childhood, and he's about my age, so he, he uh, to me, it's really fun to hear, or well, terrifying to hear that all these boys in the summer these kids would go, not allowed by any of their parents, they would go and dive into the water and quarries. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as I can tell, nobody died. But I can't, it's really hard to believe because he would explain how high they would climb and which, who dared to go up to which height and, and the kid would build a barrel raft and everybody jumped on it, but the girls weren't allowed. Uh, Lots of story, tough, tough childhood. Not, not so, not so easy. My sense of the way he grew up was that it was, it was, it was in some ways quite harsh. But he certainly had fun with all his friends in the quarries and around town, and and he brings al alive the, that the town of Barry at the, you know, in the mid mid century. Another woman was, um, <laughs> she she couldn't couldn't she was at the Canterbury Inn as it used to be in. Um, well, I'm not sure it's the right, that's the right name, but it was a, um, assisted living in St. Johnsbury, and she would just write about what was outside her window and what it reminded her of, and she would go back through her own life, um, which I loved. And yesterday we had a, at the same same uh, writers meeting where we had the man read about Millstone Hill. Um, another young woman, um, I always think of her as a young woman. She's only about ten years old, but younger than I am. But I just I think of her as about twenty. She's so full of life, Marty. Um, she wrote about growing up in, in Hanover, New Hampshire, and sneaking into all the buildings of the college. And the stuff they did, they would climb up on the outsides of these buildings, these, these little incredible stone the crenellations of these various, various edifices, and they would dare each other to, 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 to walk, you know, kind of grip and go around the side. I would just kill my kids if they did that. <laughs> and they probably did, uh, but, but her, her stories are terrific. And, uh, and it's something that, that I've found when, I, when, when people get together and start, and they've read, written some little, little thing about their life as it is now or as it was growing up, and some are so shy about sharing it. The, um, Wonderful woman, Rose Veer. I don't know if you knew Rose Veer, and she's still with us, um, and has has written. A, I think I mentioned a, um, a pandemic log of what happened at the, at the assisted living place she's living in now. But but now but she wrote about her growing up up here. Wonderful stuff, and and, uh, and it's the old town, and oh god, uh, things like uh, what the town of Waterford was basically flooded and gone for the reservoir where her grandmother lived in, in one of those farms. And she, she knew that place really well. And she, could, she said, well, I can tell you where, where that farm was and along where that farm was. And you just think of these farms way down under the water and what lives there were. People were not present when they flooded the places. But, but there's so much of that around our country. There's so many places that have disappeared for one reason or another. So she wrote about that another another woman I know wrote about harvesting ice, um, big ponds around um, Peachum where I lived for a while, and how she would she would go with go and be, you know help the men. She and her mother would give the food to the guys who were cutting out the, the ice and putting it in the ice house. And one guy fell in. He'd been wearing this big bear coat. I don't know if he was really a bear raccoon. I don't know big big coat. And they hauled him up and got him out of the coat because it was, he would have died. He was, in, uh, it was very, very cold. And for the rest of that winter, the, the coat was just there <laughs> on the porch of the, of the ice shack. And, uh, but story after story after story, and for me, it, it, is, it makes me realize that we all have so many stories. And, um, 
I mean, some of these people, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even read them out loud. They'd say, would you read this? Do you think it's all right? And it was wonderful. <laughs> of course I read it. But people were so shy about their own, their own stories. But boy, they're important. And, and of course, some of these stories, the, the library at, in St. John's or the Athenaeum was very happy to get these stories about the old, old times in, in, in St. J. And the, uh, where is this one that I love? It's a woman from, she grew up in Arkansas, I think. And, oh, I don't know if I've got this. I meant to bring it. And she just remembers everything from the 30s. And so she'd get, take you shopping in the 1930s and talk about the string and the packages being wrapped and you know, how they bought bacon and what, and then uh, you know, how her mother said her home was this or that from the store. And the, it's just gone, that whole, that whole way of shopping, that whole relation to, to the staples you bought to stay alive, basically. But, uh, but I love the um, intersection of writing and memory and how it documents us and, uh, and binds us together, whether it's my family with all the craziness and complication still held together, I think, by, by a whole lot of love and commitment and um, connection. Or, or the lives of, of my friends who, who were here when they were harvesting ice on Harvest Lake in Vermont. It's, uh, and these are stories that, that are right here. They're just all part of us. But, boy, I've been talking for a long time. Sorry. I <laughs> just can't, can't keep going and going. But, but I would be happy to answer any questions if people have. Yes, ma'am. Well, what advice do you give to somebody to get started? There's people who talk about doing it, and they don't. Ah. <laughs> you just have to make yourself do it. I mean, that's the only thing I know how to do, is, is, is to sit. And sometimes I don't, I don't even write in a diary for months at a time. But if I want to get something done, um, I have to sit and I have to write. I used to say, OK, you, can, you can't get up until you've written 100 words. And it helped. It helped because if I if I'd written a hundred words, I would keep, keep a careful track. I'd think, okay, 25, 50, 50, I go and I put a little dot next to the 50th word, and then I keep going. And sometimes it would get me started, and I would go on for pages. Sometimes it didn't, but but that was the only way I could just keep it flowing. Or if I have an assignment, if somebody says, "Who would you do an introduction to something?" Like me? Oh yes. Oh, yes, I would. And then I panic and think, what am I going to say? And then do it, because I have to. And that's a big, big, big help. I, I know people have in, must have inspiration coming to them from the beyond, but I don't. I, just, I, there's, I get some little thing that kind of nudges at me and nudges at me. And I think, oh, that would be really fun. And, um, and then I eventually get started. But I have to, I have to be very, very disciplined. Which, and I can always think of a million other things to do. <laughs> always. So, yeah. What brought you to Vermont? I came to Vermont in 1968. Yes. Um, just barely, just newly married, and my husband was uh, had applied for and gotten a job in um, oh boy, Whitingham High School in Whitingham, Vermont, and um, he was. Uh, he was just the age, the Vietnam age, and he went to, to, to the draft board, and we were, oh, yeah, yeah, is he going to go? Is he going to go to Canada? Is he, you know, what's he going to do? Um, and he, he turned out he had a leg length discrepancy that he didn't even know about, and, and that was from polio that he wasn't aware of as a child, so he didn't go. My second husband was a platoon leader in Vietnam and did go and um, has never gotten over it. So he's written a book about, about that time, Father, Soldier, Son, um, which is beautiful. But it's either way, it's hard. But he, so he was teaching there, and I got a job teaching in Reedsboro. It was a tiny little school, taught second grade. There were 10 kids the first year in my class, my second grade, and 12 the next year. And then after that, we moved north. We moved just to the St. Johnsbury area, to Peachum. Um, and that's, I've been in that part of the Northeast Kingdom ever since. That's how it happened long ago, yes. I have a comment about memoirs and then a question yes. for you. Um, I was lucky enough to have my mother, who was 41 when I was born, 
told me many stories of her childhood. Oh boy. Which is very different in New York, the immigrant areas. Uh -huh. And uh, I wrote them all down for my children. I think that's an easy way to start. That's you a wonderful way. The public, but your own family. Yeah, if you and want you to write for your children. Writing, and they loved it. So my question for you is about your family. I grew up in New Jersey, and all the stories were about the missing women. Of babies. course, yeah. And Were you scared at all? Some, some of them. You were too little. All oh, good. That mystery was it ever solved? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was for money, and the, the, the man was Richard Houtman, and he was in fact electrocuted, he was, which was very much. My mother was so against it. He said it was just horrible that that happened. Now, well, you know, that was that was what what was done. He was. That was the, uh, the punishment, and I think much of it came from the publicity and so on. Um, and there were all kinds of theories and you know conspiracy theories, as they call them now. But but that's it's pretty clear that that's what it was and who it was. Um, and the, uh, yeah, people have told me stories. And oh, it was Maurice Sendak, at, well, yeah, who was also writing with Amy, and. Um, and he told me a story. I met him at, a, at an event, um, and he told me that that when oh, let's see, what, oh, he it was very it made a huge impression upon him because he was a little boy at that same time, and that was the inspiration for where the wild things are. Oh. It came out of that out of that story, and that you know, true story. And others. Others. and others, he said as well. Right. Yeah, that's right. Or others. Yeah. Well, that theme does go through. There's yeah. there's a child. Oh, yeah. Gone. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Edie. I'm curious. Um, uh, this is a more technical question. I'm curious whether you write uh, in longhand. Do uh, you write it with pen and paper, or do you compose on a computer? I start on on, on in pen and paper because it, it feels less. <laughs> it doesn't scare me as much. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting there writing along, and I can cross things out, and I. And I and usually I get a couple of pages in, or, or more, sometimes more, um, and then I start to put it on the computer, because boy, it's great to be able to change words and all that so, so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that you use a lot of detail in your writing. And things are very rich. Oh, I love detail. And, and I wonder, is that how it comes out at the beginning, or do you go back and revise and say, oh yeah, I forgot this? That happens. That happens. It, it's often um, when I, if I'm thinking back to to when they ask me to put another, a, a, they said you don't locate yourself in this book somewhere along and under a wing. And I thought, well, I'm just going to start by coming in the door, and maybe I can do it. And so I started um, about writing about the door, and I remembered what that big oak door was, and it kind of looked like a huge waffle. <laughs> one of those big old oak doors. And then I came in and I remembered what, what the coat closet was like. I mean, it got a little carried away, but but I did I do take myself back to somewhere. And it happens anyway. You know, as you're walking along or thinking something and you something comes back to you from a long way. And that that for me those are that's cool if I can remember. I like it to be as true as it possibly can. And sometimes I, you know, I'm sure I don't have it right, but so I can say, well, as I remember it, and then one of my brothers and somebody else will say, well, I don't remember it that way. <laughs> so, but that's fun. <laughs> it's your story. Ah. This is a question about memory yeah. and writing. Mm -hmm. um, do you just write your memory to the extent you can recall mm -hmm. that, and then I haven't really done that. I sometimes will will call a sibling, and there, well, there's still another two of them left. There were five of us, and there's three of us now. But I'll say, what well, was that? Was this where? And, and and often they they're about they're older. And so they'll say, well, actually, it was in the garden of our grandmother's house in Detroit. And, and sometimes they'll get going and talking, talking about it. And I always, I always give them credit. You know, my brother said, because that's their memories need to be credited, I think. So, uh, 
it, it is a, it's, it's just writing like any other thing that you do is creative. If you're not, if you're not disciplined externally, I find, it's so easy to run away from it. And I heard a story that, that is it Margot Fontaine, one of, one of the wonderful um, ballet artists, wrote in her memoir, which I have not read, about how hard she would run away. You know, she would do everything. She'd do all the laundry. She'd run down the street to pick up a newspaper, and she would mend the socks, and she would do whatever until she ran up against the wall. But she really didn't have something else she had to do. And then she'd start to write. And I guess a follow-up to that is I, do I you see sense it. that your memory kind of evolves or changes over time? It probably does. Um, but, okay, this first one was published in, I think, 1998. Oh, uh, yes, I think so. And um, the last one was 2018. Yeah, so that would be 20 years. Um, so far, these still ring true to me. I mean, I'm, if I went over the same, it's, it's, if I went over again, if I had an editing job to go over this, these stories again, then I might have new ideas or new, new memories or, or just analyses that would be different. I might, but I haven't, I haven't done that. So, it's an interesting question. Ah, oh, you're so nice to be here. I mean, <laughs> ramble and Babylon. <laughs> Thank you very much. And My pleasure. I'm here for a little bit, yeah. Okay. yeah.